and welcome to another edition of Global Nerve Advancements. I'm your host, Ann Ingeman, a member of the Global Nerve Foundation Research Committee. And today I have with me a fellow Research Committee member, Dr. Daryl Sneeg, as well as another guest, Dr. Tan. Dr. Sneeg is a radiologist who specializes in peripheral nerve MRI at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. And Dr. Tan is a previous principal scientist at General Electric's Research Center and current co-director of the MRI lab at the Hospital for Special Surgery. And we're here today to hear about the recent paper on MRI for patients with EMG-confirmed Parsonage-Turner syndrome. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, so let me share my screen. So we're here to share a uh, recent publication on hourglass-like constrictions on MRI are common in EMG-confirmed cases of neurologic amyotrophy or Parsonage-Turner syndrome a tertiary referral center experience. Uh, this is a recently published paper in Muscle and Nerve in August of this year, and these are our co-authors. So Parsonage Turner syndrome, or PTS, or, is also known as neurologic amyotrophy or brachial neuritis. It's considered a rare peripheral neuropathy uh, that results in pain followed by severe weakness in the distribution of one or more nerves of the upper extremity. It's believed to be an inflammatory response to an antecedent event, and there's currently no consensus on treatment methods and timelines. Common diagnostic tools for PTS include physical examination and electrodiagnostics, especially electromyography or EMG. Seen here, you, uh, these are some uh, signs and symptoms of thoracic nerve, uh, long thoracic nerve involved PTS and muscle caninus nerve involved PTS. Imaging may also be used to assess neuropathy using a magnetic resonance neurography and the nerve ultrasound. Our glass like constrictions have been observed in PTS. These are focally uh, reduced nerve caliber observations and are thought to be specific to PTS and have been seen in surgery and also on imaging. We can detect HGCs with uh, magnetic resonance neurography, uh, but these have mostly been shown in a small case series. The goal of this work was to assess the sensitivity of MRN to HGCs and MRN interrater agreement in a larger patient cohort. So our goals are to evaluate the sensitivity and interrater agreement again of MRN for detecting HGCs in EMG-confirmed PTS cases. And we hypothesized that MRN would be greater than 90% sensitive to that uh, and also will achieve a 90% or greater interrater agreement. We recruited uh, about 123 subjects uh, retrospectively, and these were subjects diagnosed with PTS and were identified uh, on our MRN database. Altogether, we assessed about 183 nerves with multiple nerves per patient. For comparison, we, we compared MRN against uh, the ground truth of EMG confirmed innovation potentials of this and discrete or non multi unit recruitment. To assess interrater reliability, we had two radiologists independently graded the presence or absence of HGCs for each nerve. Imaging was performed at three Tesla MRI using combination of 2D and 3D sequences. These are some of the findings from our uh, paper. On the left shows a long thoracic nerve neuropathy, and you see the arrows pointing to two constrictions seen in the nerve. Uh, this is a suprascapular neuropathy in the middle with two constrictions on the suprascapular nerve and another example of axillary neuropathy with one constriction. In all, we found uh, uh, that HGCs were observed in 90.2% of all PTS patients, and HGCs were highly sensitive to EMG-confirmed PTS at about the same rate. The interrater agreement was very high as well, at 91.8% to 94.3%. If you'd like to learn more about this paper, you can scan the QR code or find this paper. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting study. Um, I'm interested to know uh, how common is Parsonage Turner syndrome and, and what is the referral pathway for these patients? Because I think in the, the paper, it said that the average time to diagnosis was 44 weeks, which seems like a really long time. Right. So that's a really uh, great question, Anne. And uh, right. I, I think I could take that one. So Historically, the uh, incidence to be measured as one to two individuals per 100,000 
Um, there's a recent study by a colleague of mine, uh, Nens Van Elfen, Netherlands, where she trained uh, local practitioners to try to recognize PTS early. And over a, a time period of one year, they actually measured incidents of one in a thousand. Uh, we think that the incidents might lie somewhere between those numbers, uh, particularly in a community where the practitioners may not be trained and may have not have a kind of a close uh, tied network. Um, the uh, incidents you measure, uh, or sorry, the delay in diagnosis that you mentioned about 44 weeks, this has been reported not, this wasn't, um, you know, this has been reported in, in the literature as well. And this is one of our goals actually at HSS is to try to identify patients early, uh, earlier, um, not only to help um, them navigate the system, even though there's no uh, consensus again on treatment, but we believe that if treatment um, were to be successful and often steroids are considered by uh, practitioners when the signs and symptoms are recognized early, um, then the treatment would be more effective. And so in this paper, I think the, you know, the, the uh, important message from this paper is that MRI can help aid into the detection. Sometimes the presentation is very classic, patient has severe pain and then develops scapular winging um, but particularly in the early stages, the diagnosis could be confounded with other diagnoses, such as a cervical radiculopathy or some other explanation. Um, and therefore, if you have an objective tool like MRI to identify it earlier, this would open up the treatment pathway to, to identify patients earlier. With regards to recognizing other patients, how are these patients identified? Um, there's really no one unifying route, if you will. Sometimes, um, just as a radiologist, I'm reading a shoulder MRI, and I, we see what looks like denervation of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles, and it might suggest a, a suprascapular neuropathy. Now, if there's no mass um, along the course of the suprascapular nerve, then immediately the diagnosis of Parsons Turner syndrome comes um, front and center. It's isolated. So sometimes it can come directly uh, on imaging. We can recognize it. Um, often patients will go to a shoulder specialist, whether it's a, a non-operative or operative specialist, and a good percentage of patients actually will go to the emergency room. Um, and often in the middle of the night, they develop such severe pain um, that they really just can't handle it. They go to the emergency room and in the emergency room, you know, often the diagnosis may not be again, front and center mm -hmm. um, on people's minds. And they just rule out uh, some, you know, uh, potentially devastating diagnoses like a stroke or, or heart attack and send the patient home. Um, so this is one of, I think, the, you know, the challenges to really studying uh, the disorder. Yeah, it seems, it seems like a common theme with a lot of different nerve pain syndromes is that it takes a long time for, um, for the diagnosis. Um, it seems to be they have to rule a lot of things out before um, actually getting treated for the cause of the pain. That's right. Um, so it seems like, you know, we've seen a, a lot of growing interest in nerve imaging, um, lots of new studies coming out. Um, what advances in um, nerve imaging uh, have helped make these studies possible? Dr. Tan, would you like to take that one? <laughs> sure. sure. I, I'll mention a couple of them. The first is that um, we have been applying um, deep learning reconstruction in some of the uh, images and what it does is to improve the image quality, especially the sharpness, and also uh, in, in reducing the, the amount of noise. That helps to make the the images a little more uh, a little clearer, and this is especially helpful in visualizing some of these uh, uh, nerve uh, uh, cases because there's often uh, we're trying to image at very high spatial resolution, which means that the noise increases. At, when all imaging at these resolutions. The other advantage is that these technologies can also help us to reduce scan time. Uh, and that helps because some of these nerve territories uh, are in places where the patients move a lot. As, as you know, MRIs do take a while to acquire. So it helps. So deep learning technology does help us to uh, improve the image quality over time. The other thing that I would mention is that we're uh, at HSS, we're also very interested in testing and also developing new uh, coil technologies. And these are uh, hardware uh, antenna that receive the MRI signal 
and these technologies help us to get closer to the anatomy and improve the signal to noise ratio. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your study with us. The I, I think the um, the images are just amazing, and I I know that this is um, a field of growing interest for people. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing um, what you guys do in the future. Thanks so much, Anne. It's really been our pleasure to be with you today here and uh, discuss our study. Thank My you. My pleasure as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>